Okay. Um, That's it. Is that going to disappear? Right, we just there's this bar at the bottom there. No, I can't think it'll disappear. Uh, never mind. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about. Hello. Yeah. Oh, there it's gone. Yeah. Right. Sorry for those hiccups at the beginning. That's uh, we should have tested our uh, Teams connections uh, before, and I haven't used it for such a long time. I think that was the problem. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for joining this morning. Um, we're a bit short of time, I think now, so I'll scamper through as, as quickly as I can without losing the thread. Um, the title there, the IWARF project, using a citizen science approach to investigate the ecological status of the Pennine River. Um, that's a bit ambitious, uh, but uh, we'll talk about the work that we've been doing uh, here on the River Wharf over the last four or five years, uh, mainly with a citizen science uh, involvement. So next slide, please. So I, I, I called it the IWARF project, but essentially it's an amalgam of a number of projects, uh, starting with what I've called the Ashland project, which is all about faecal bacteria and bathing water designation in Ilkley. Moving on to the IWARF project, which uh, uh, brings in uh, not just the faecal bacteria story, but also nutrient chemistry and, and uh, nutrient enrichment using diatoms as well as chemistry. And then finishing off with what I call the Eco Ashlands project, where we're focusing back uh, on conditions around the sewage works upstream and downstream of the town of Ilkley. Uh, looking at the impact or, or lack of impact in some cases of untreated effluent and treated effluent on the on water quality and bringing in at that point macroinvertebrates as well as chemistry and diatoms and then finishing off hopefully have time with some uh, reflections. Next please. So just to orient our, ourselves, this is the, the wharf catchment. The, the map in the top right there, you can see just that little red outline there. It's a fairly typical Pennine River. It's got uh, high elevation headwaters around about 400 meters, uh, runs down through the middle reaches and joins the ooze uh, just south of York, where we're down to uh, not that far off, uh, off sea level. Um, the red lines there, the, the dot uh, and the dot, the red dot, the red dot is Ilkley, that's where we'll be starting. Um, then the long line uh, shows the extent of the uh, catchment, uh, and that's a transect along which we carried out the main IWARF project. Uh, and then the ellipse uh, is the Eco Ashlands project, where we'll be looking a little bit more around the Ilkley area at the ecological impact of sewage effluents at that point. Next, please. And yeah, my favorite place in, in Ilkley, the Ilkley Sewage Treatment Works, you can see uh, there the, the map behind, there's a river uh, running uh, from left to right. Uh, and you can see the position of the sewage works and the red arrows showing the position of the storm overflow uh, picture there and the treated effluent outfall uh, picture there separated by about 50 to 100 meters and that's important because it allows us later on to separate out the impacts of the storm flow from the treated outfall but also it shows that this part of the river is used quite extensively for recreation uh, you can see the picture in the top left hand corner there that's at the Cromwell corner which is the most popular site in Ilkley for bathing water uh, and it's uh, as you can see upstream of the sewage works but there's also a relatively popular beach further downstream at Beanlands Island which as you can see is just immediately downstream uh, of the sewage treatment works. Next please. So the first focus back in 2018 was on the uh, problem of untreated sewage discharges where local people were beginning to notice that there were lots of untreated discharges, a lot of brown water in the river, uh, reported from about 2016, 2017. 
and uh, the Yorkshire water and to some extent the environment agency were not particularly interested in it because the discharges were taking place uh, with with permissions that was the argument uh, the local people became pretty angry about the, the situation and formed a campaign group called the Ilkley uh, Clean River group next please and uh, I got involved at that point because I just retired recently to, to this part of the world uh, and was invited to join the group. And I thought, well, the first thing to do is to get some data uh, from the river and let's look for fecal bacteria data. But then we found out that the Environment Agency doesn't monitor fecal bacteria uh, in, uh, in water bodies if, unless they're designated as bathing water. So I thought, well, the best thing to do is to do it ourselves and set up a citizen science project to look at the numbers around the sewage works and see if we can identify uh, the different sources of pollution. Uh, so we got started with funding from Ilkley Town Council, uh, the Rivers Trust, I've got £500 from, from Michelle, the Rivers Trust, and £500 from the local naturalist society, and I think it's about three or £4,000 for the Town Council, enough to start up some faecal bacteria uh, analyses. Next, please. Uh, and our citizen, citizen scientists, uh, quite a strong group, but we only needed two or three. And the key ones were, were the two people you can see on the screen there, very keen anglers who knew the river well. And we used those to collect water samples. So the first sample we collected was this one uh, on the right hand side on the 29th of April in 2019. And uh, we engaged a commercial laboratory, ALS, uh, to do the fecal bacteria analysis for us. Next, please. And so just a couple of uh, results very quickly. This is uh, from June 2019. And by chance on this particular occasion, the river was running really quite high. So it's, uh, and there was a spill occurring from the untreated, untreated uh, uh, spill of untreated effluent from the storm overflow. And you can see those numbers there. I think about a thousand uh, E. coli coliform units per hundred mil as being a kind of safe threshold, something like that. Bear that sort of figure of a thousand in mind. You can see these figures are all massively higher than that in these conditions. It's not only high uh, below the storm overflow uh, and below the treated effluent overflow. It's always it's also very high. In fact, upstream. Um, and upstream, we don't really have any towns. We have a few small villages and a lot of a uh, lot of agriculture. Uh, so that's showing that the the Cromwell Corner, the most popular bathing beach, just on the bend in the river, there uh, is is not a, a a clean site in at least in these conditions. The other interesting thing was the rapid decline in concentrations as you go downstream to the figure there of nine thousand five hundred, representing. Um, Two, well, two things. One is that 43,000 may well have been sampled in the plume from the sewage works, but there's also quite a rapid die-off of bacterial concentrations as well. Next, please. But then just a month later, uh, river levels were way down uh, and there were no spills occurring from the storm overflow. You can see there that 350 uh, is the value below the storm outflow. Uh, not, of course, discharging of that uh, in these conditions and upstream pretty low levels, 450 and 100. But then below the sewage works, we've got this uh, huge figure of 35,000 or so, uh, indicating that it's not just fecal bacteria coming from untreated effluent that a lot of people think about. Uh, in fact, treated effluents have got very high concentrations of, uh, of E. coli as well. And then you can see the decline back to uh, downstream there to 10,000 or so with, with that die off. Next, please. So at this point, in the Environment Agency and the Yorkshire Water who were being held to account by the local campaign group, in fact, were still not really responding in the way that the local community had hoped they would. Uh, and it was suggested at a, a town meeting uh, by our MP at the time, John Grogan, uh, that maybe one of the things to raise more awareness about the issue was to apply for bathing water status. And so our data on the river water quality was actually useful in that application, but the main thrust of the application uh, and the main thrust of bathing water applications uh, is, the, is the evidence for 
popularity with visitors using the site for recreation. And so uh, under Becky Mulby's leadership, the Ilka Clean River Group organized uh, visit accounts uh, on almost every day during the bathing water season in 2019. You can see the data there on the right hand side of the most popular day, I think just after the end of the school term in the summer and a warm, uh, warm day that Tuesday. Uh, nearly 2,000 people using the water. So the combination of the evidence of popularity, the facilities locally, and to some extent, the water quality data that we were collecting was sufficient. Next slide, please, Gwen, uh, for us to be awarded uh, bathing water status on the 22nd of December, 2020. It took over a year for that decision uh, to come through, but it was the year, of course, when the country was tackling the COVID. Uh, pandemic. Next, please. Well, the question was, as with that bathing water designation, including both the downstream site, the Beelands Island site, and that upstream site, the Cromwell, and knowing that in certain conditions there are high concentrations of faecal bacteria coming into Ilkley downstream, uh, the question was, where are the sources upstream? Uh, is it just a simple question of uh, treated effluents? Uh, uh, most of the time an untreated effluent from small village sewage works, or in fact, could there be a major source coming from agriculture as well? And so we needed to begin to look at evidence for uh, upstream sources to explain those higher numbers at the Cromwell Corner. Next one, please. And what we have uh, upstream, just three kilometres upstream, is where, in fact, we're sitting now in the village of uh, Addingham. Uh, Addingham used to have a sewage works uh, of its own, um, but in the 1970s, um, it, it, the sewage from this village here, which is about three and a half thousand people, uh, was then um, pumped down to Ilkley. And so the sewage works, the local sewage works, became a pumping station. But of course, it's got storage tanks. Uh, and, and itself uh, gets uh, overloaded in, 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 in rainfall. Uh, and you can see here these two pictures. This is November 2019, uh, a spill occurring from the pumping station. Uh, and you can see the poor quality there of the water in the receiving mill stream. Um, a permit that's allowed by the Environment Agency, but it looks as far as we can see, has never been renewed or re reviewed since uh, in the 1970s. And, uh, uh, it discharges into this millstream lagoon before it goes into the River Wharf and then down to Ilkley. Next, please. And we've managed to pick that up a couple of times by sampling uh, after a, 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 a rainfall event. So again, this is a high flow and a spill, and you can see the Ilkley bottom right, you're adding in the village in the middle there, and then upstream towards Bolton Abbey at the top. And so sampling down from Bolton Abbey, those are the figures for E. coli, uh, relatively low numbers upstream, 700, 700, 400, 600. We come down to Addingham. The little <coughs> red arrow there is where the uh, overflow from the pumping station uh, enters the river wharf. And there's a black line I put in there, and then you can see it jumps from 600 there to 2,000. Uh, and then it's 2,000 or so until we get to Ilkley. Uh, and then we would jump up to these massive numbers from the untreated flows from the sewage works um, and from the treated effluent as well. And then that declined downstream. And then the next one, please. Uh, a year later, we picked up the same thing, not quite so far upstream here, but you can see top left 300 there. That's, if you like, the control site upstream from Addingham. But on this occasion, I showed this because uh, on this occasion, we were I was able to sample the actual outflow itself from the pumping station. And you can see in the yellow uh, rectangle there, these are figures for both E. coli and uh, intestinal enterococci. Uh, the blue is the E. coli. So you can see at that point, the discharge into the wharf was uh, nearly a million uh, E. coli coliforming units uh, in, in 100 mil. And that was sufficient to jump the numbers up again to two to 3,000 in the main river. So that's despite the dilution of the river of over 100 times or so. And then again, coming down to Ilkley, we get the same story again. Uh, the big increase from the untreated sewage, 
uh, the treated sewage and then the decrease downstream. Next, please. So quite clearly in certain conditions, uh, spills from Addingham are, are causing poor water quality conditions coming into Ilkley in the part of the story. But what about the agricultural sources? Uh, it seemed at first that we, we'd found the smoking gun <laughs> from the uh, untreated effluent upstream. Um, but uh, we eventually found good evidence that there uh, are high concentrations also in certain conditions coming from agricultural land, probably associated with, uh, with cows uh, and possibly and sheep as well. But here's a nice picture, I think, really just showing the evidence of cows coming into uh, a beck. Uh, and it seems that their program, you see the one in the middle there, the white cow there, uh, programmed to lift their tail uh, and to add to the concentrations of pollutants directly uh, into the water. So uh, next one, please. And on this particular occasion, uh, we were able to actually demonstrate that because it was a day after prolonged rain, but in fact, not so much rain that the, uh, that the sewage works were, uh, were discharging untreated effluent into the river. Uh, but on these three small becks coming into the wharf in the Addingham area, you can see these high numbers, seven to 9,000 also and in one of the catchments one of the right there is a tiny uh, sewage treatment works treating with a small village uh, and some septic tanks but by and large these are essentially agricultural catchments next one please and again here are the numbers uh bolton abbey down to uh, ilkley uh, and in red here now these are the numbers in the river itself and in the yellow, there are the numbers and the tributaries coming in. Uh, and you can see as we come down from Bolton Abbey to, uh, to Addingham, we get that big increase in numbers. But that, this time, it's not an increase that's explained by an overflow from the pumping station in Addingham. Uh, this seems to be an increase associated with high concentrations coming in from these agricultural tributaries. Next, please. So at that point, we could make a number of conclusions uh, in dry, low flow river conditions. Oh, one back, please, Gwen, that's flicked over, I think, to the next slide. Yeah, thank you. Uh, in dry, low flow river conditions, E. coli concentrations are relatively low upstream. They're always high downstream um, because of the continuous flow from the treated effluent. Uh, the untreated sewage has got high concentrations, but of course those discharges are intermittent. Um, we know that there's uh, high concentrations coming into the bathing water from upstream, are partly due to the pumping station in Addingham and partly due to agricultural sources. And we've got concentrations dying off downstream. Next, please. So this led us into the IWARF project. We're asking these questions. Uh, how does the Ilkley situation compare with other sites upstream and downstream of Ilkley along the full length of the River Wharf? Are there other recreational sites uh, along the length of the wharf where people are being uh, exposed to high concentrations of faecal pathogens? Um, what about the impact of faecal pathogens, faecal bacteria uh, on ecology? Um, we know of concern for human health. Uh, there was a lot of confusion at the time because uh, local people were, were arguing that the uh, concentrations of faecal bacteria uh, could be causing ecological damage where from our scientific freshwater biological aspect we might be expecting in fact it to be ecological more related in fact to other factors especially water quality uh, related to nutrient pollution so the question at this stage was does how does the ecosystem health change downstream in comparison comparison to changes in faecal bacteria and can we sample the full length of the river for both faecal indicator organisms and for uh, water chemistry nutrient chemistry um, sufficiently quickly so we can have comparable data along the full length of the river and we can only do that because it's such a variable flow in the river um, that we, if we actually sample during similar uh, weather conditions and so we wanted to do that as quickly as possible and certainly in less than a day. And the only way to really do that is to use citizen 
science. And at this point, we began to work very closely with the Yorkshire Dales Rivers Trust uh, and was strongly supported by the Environment Agency. Next one, please. And so this is the river again. And how did we do it? Well, we divided it up into five zones. See the color coding there with teams of five people in, divided into two because of COVID. We couldn't have more than two or three people uh, meeting together. But we had a fecal bacteria team and a nutrient uh, chemistry team. Each uh, team had 12 sites. We collected 60 samples. There were 32 recreational sites that we met, looked at specially. Uh, we looked at selected tributaries. Uh, and we managed to complete sampling the, the 125 kilometers there in four hours for fecal bacteria and nutrient chemistry. And then I went along afterwards and spent a few weeks, in fact, collecting data on samples from each of those uh, sites. Next, please. Important thing about river flow, as I mentioned, to try to, this is the uh, Environment Agency monitoring data for river flow from sites upstream, Kettlewell, uh, through Addingham right the way down through Otley along the length of the river. Uh, and you can see the little red on the right hand side, six days there, you can see that little uh, red bar uh, that showing the period we were taking the samples. Uh, and so all the samples were more or less at a, at a very similar sort of river height and, and flow regime. And you can see the, the peaks in flow going downstream there. Uh, from the green lines uh, showing the speed with which the flows are uh, carrying the pollutants. Uh, next one, please. And these are the fecal bacteria data. You can't see that it's, uh, can't see the, the site names and it's too small. Uh, but what I've put in there, uh, it, it's from the headwater down to Kaywood, which is just near York. Uh, and the blue are E. coli and the red are inter, in, uh, intestinal enterococci uh, and it clearly shows Ilkley there standing out there that tall blue bar in the middle but it also shows in these high flow conditions high concentrations downstream of Ilkley and um, that's easily I think explainable because we've got uh, small towns all the way down all with their own sewage works all uh, discharging effluent into the river uh, and then there are die-offs and the injections of, uh, of new bacterial sources. But also upstream, quite surprisingly, in fact, some very high concentrations in Upper Wharfdale, a, a rural area, small villages. There's a Grassington sewage treatment works, uh, and there are high concentrations below it, but also upstream. So uh, almost certainly some of these uh, high concentrations are coming from uh, agricultural sources as well as from sewage treatment works. Next one, please. But what I want to focus on now is mainly on the on the nutrient uh, uh, and eutrophication aspects of, of the IWARF work. And this was just amazing to be able to sample the river so quickly that the data coming downstream are so comparable. These, the coherence of the chemistry, as you can see in the histograms on the left, is quite amazing. So we got pH and alkalinity and dissolved oxygen. But then you can see the phosphate and nitrate concentrations there, in particular the phosphate, phosphorus, uh, undetectable below the limits of detection until we come to Ilkley. And there's that tall bar in Ilkley, and that's the sewage treatment works in Ilkley. Um, uh, and it's so high, I think, because I think we were sampling directly into the plume. But then you can see downstream uh, consistently. Uh, consistently high. No, well, not that high, actually. These, these are 20 to 30 micrograms per litre. Um, but it's very clear from this, from the whole river, that Ilkley is the strongest source of nutrient pollution uh, in the river. Next, please. But uh, the diatoms are important because we need to look at the biological impacts and the biology tends to integrate the chemistry uh, to give us perhaps uh, a rather more uh, balanced picture of what's going on. Uh, and so here's taking epilytic diatoms. The great rivers of these Pennine rivers are diatoms because they tend to have uh, cobbles on their beds which grow beautiful biofilms of uh, mainly diatoms, as you can see uh, on the right. Next one, please. And here are the diatom data. Um, don't again worry too much about the names uh, and the sites, but again, if you're looking uh, downstream there, you can see. Um, I think there might be an animation there, just a bit of red barring, Gwen, if you pop the... Yeah, there it goes. You can see there's a, just a completely major change there in the assemblage composition of the diatoms. 
uh, with a drop off at that Glanthes group there, and then the occurrence of lots of uh, other species which are well known to indicate more nutrient rich uh, waters there. If you pop another bar, another animate, there we go. But interestingly, this wasn't picked up by the chemistry because it was a snapshot chemistry, but it's picked up by the diatoms. Uh, even though the water quality is high upstream, you can see there where that red bar starts at Grassington. Uh, there's a beginning of a record there of a diatom called Nitsia paleo, which is typically found in, in uh, organic uh, nutrient rich waters. So the diatoms complement the, the chemical data in giving us a, a, a clear picture, I think, of the nutrient enrichment as we come downstream. It's still really quite high quality. Next, please. So these are some of the conclusions from, from that particular study along the length of the wharf about the importance of Ilkley, uh, the high concentrations below Ilkley, um, the inwash again from agricultural lands and spills upstream, uh, the chemistry from uh, Ilkley, and the importance of the epilithic diatom assemblages, uh, and the evidence, extra evidence provided by the diatoms uh, for eutrophication further up. Next, please. But so we, uh, next questions were, where exactly does that abrupt change in nutrient chemistry and diatom assemblage uh, occur in that IWARF project? We weren't sampling particularly closely uh, around the, the sewage works. And so it was a question of, uh, what's the impact of the intermittent discharges from the untreated effluent in, in relation to the continuous discharge of uh, nutrient-rich treated effluent, or are we dealing with an impact on the ecology from both sources? Um, and then thinking about the importance of the untreated discharges where with high nutrient concentration, high fecal bacteria, but also in contrast to the treated, we're dealing with uh, organic matter discharges. And so it's a question then of oxygen concentrations and the need to look uh, at macroinvertebrate assemblages as well as diatom assemblages. So we brought in uh, some uh, citizen scientists to collect the uh, macroinvertebrates bottom left hand corner, uh, but we, uh, we uh, had the analyses done by APEM so we could get a full professional uh, analysis of the macroinvertebrates. Next, please. And so this is now focusing back on Ilkley. You can see the size, 10 sites from upstream of Addingham to through Ilkley down to number 10 there, which is in Otley. And uh, five, six and seven are the key sites because it's the untreated effluent between five and six and the treated effluent between uh, six and seven. Next site, please. And so here we have the data on the left. These are the uh, data for the diatoms compared with the nutrient chemistry. So we can see exactly the same data as for IWARF. If we look at the nutrients, the phosphate and the nitrate at the bottom, very low values until we hit the Ilkley sewage works. But interestingly, by sampling between the untreated outflow uh, and, uh, and below the sewage works, at sites six and seven compared with five, we can see that that very, very clear change in chemistry and in diatom assemblage occurs below the treated effluent site where that uh, purple bar is there. It, there is very little to this, no change in fact really, um, between upstream at the Cromwell corner of five and downstream of the untreated effluent at six. So all the ecological impact is coming from the treated effluent and there's very little, at least from the diatoms and the chemistry evidence of an impact from the untreated flows. Next one, please. That's where we really want then to examine the evidence from the macroinvertebrate data. Uh, and again, uh, you can see the uh, sites uh, and the uh, main uh, macroinvertebrate uh, data types there. You're looking right at the bottom, you can see that, in fact, there's very little change in abundance. Uh, there's uh, very little change in that indicator WHPT, ASPT. And if you look at the uh, mayfly uh, and stonefly and, 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 and caddis, uh, the actual abundances and proportions of those uh, clear water indicators, clean water indicators, in fact, doesn't change all that much. Some evidence possibly that there's some uh, increase in mollusks downstream, 
but by and large, there is no specific impact from the treated effluent or the untreated effluent on the macroinvertebrate assemblage. Next one, please. So in summary, from a pollution aspect, we can see this uh, importance of the treated effluent, both in terms of fecal bacteria. I have to go through these, Gwen, please. Just click them through, yeah. Um, importance of agriculture, but we've all got to remember that there's also septic tanks and all sorts of other uh, aspects. And the ch sources change very massively in relation to weather conditions and and river flow when we're talking about faecal bacteria. And the treated effluent is a main source of nutrient pollution uh, and it's indicated by the diatoms, but not by the invertebrates. And the last point I think on here would be, uh, but the invertebrate assemblages change little downstream and it indicates that the river remains well oxygenated despite the untreated and treated effluent discharges. Now this is a kind of conclusion that might apply to a lot of Pennine rivers, but maybe not to uh, rivers elsewhere. I think we've just lost. Are you still there, Rick? Yeah, we've, the computer's just said we've run into an issue, restart. Oh. <laughs> So oh, I've here, we go. here we go. Says some yeah, lessons. Keep, yeah, just keep going. Uh, how long have I got, Gwen? Can you still give me five minutes? Or yeah, absolutely. Go for it. Okay. Right. Next one. Yeah. So that's the story. Just some reflections. Again, just emphasising the importance. Oh, we're still getting little messages on our computer here. Um, oh. Well. Oh, I'll have to sign in again. We've still got you on screen and we can hear you. Well, I can. Uh, we're just playing with it here. I can. Yes, I can hear. Rick can well. you see my slides? Yeah, we can see this. Well, I can so see the slides, but it's my screen. Yeah, it's our computer just thrown us out in fact for some it's because reason. Of, yes. Yeah. Um, okay, well, if I remember then, the first one was <laughs> all to do with flow again. And it was just trying to say that um, what I call synoptic sampling, um, snapshot sampling, in fact, really. I think we may have lost Rick. Yeah, it looks like we might have done. OK, I'm just going to stop the share so that I can get back into the call. Uh, really sorry about that, everyone. I was actually really getting into this. Um, <laughs> um, but it does look like Rick has dropped off the call. Um, hopefully he will be able to get back on very soon. Um, Gwen, so would, that... you, would you like me to talk about the next seminar? Oh, oh here he is. He's, he's back. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. Welcome back. <laughs> All right. Thanks. But I can't, um, we haven't got any. I haven't got any pictures. But can you? Have you got the pictures? Uh, yeah, I, I stopped the share so that I could uh, sort of get into the back screen, but I'll, I will go back onto your presentation and we can and we can finish off. Um, so I'll do that now. So hopefully you can see that again now. Oh, we're in business. Yeah. Off you go. <laughs> oh, that's good. I've got I've got, oh, I got an echo on the line. I can hear myself twice. Uh, and there's all sorts of messages. That look to the computer screen here now, but just very quickly there, just to reinforce the importance of this synoptic approach to sampling. Uh, but of course it needs to be repeated because the conditions are changing. The example here, we sampled Upper Wharf three times. 
I was hoping to get some higher flows and lower flows, and it so happened it was uh, it was so dry that uh, that particular spring that we hit low flows uh, on each of our sampling occasions there. So there needs to be not just an optic sampling, but we think it's an optic sampling, and of course weight of actually catching the individual storm events as well. Yeah. Okay. Next one, please. Yeah. I just want to make this point here is uh, the importance of of including subcatchments and tributaries. There's so much emphasis on on main rivers, uh, but quite clearly to understand the whole of the water body, including all the headwaters and and the tributaries. Um, Environmental one thing, of course, is essentially too infrequent and too large on a special scale, in fact, to characterize the, the whole whole water body. An example here is the water body of the Wharf of the city. It's a funny shape there, as you can see. Um, that's because some of the catchments are sufficiently large to be water bodies in their own right, and it leaves us with this particular water body there uh, that then is an amalgamation of lots of small catchments. And the one I there is the one uh, called Town Beck in Adium, which is about five meters away from where I'm sitting. Um, I've looked at this in a little bit of detail, um, and as well as the other adding effects. So I just have to move on to the next, please. Uh, so what we did in Iwolf, as I said, we measured some of the some of the temperatures as well as the the main river, and in the blue uh, histogram there you see data phosphate and nitrate from the main river but we put in gray uh, the concentration from the tributaries in their correct uh, geographical order coming downstream and so you can see that these four or five becks that have much much higher concentrations of phosphate you know, than the actual uh, river water the levels are detectable that's partly because i think the lift on the algae in the actually green phosphorus comes in, so they're using it very quickly, not getting much to measure the water, but also because of the massive damage off the bottom of the main river. Uh, but we need to go into the subcatchments and the conditions of the subcatchment. And so I just think the next one shows us to we have off of town back. Next slide. Uh, and here you see the river on the on the right hand side there, and then this is called town back on back the running from left to right. And that figure of ten in the far left, that's agricultural land, that's pretty good. Ten micrograms per litre. Um that's clean as Rick, Rick can there. I just interrupt you a minute? Somebody yeah. suggested that maybe you could turn off your I don't know if it's easy to do, can you turn off your speaker? Because it's hard to hear you clearly. Well, you're getting... Yeah. No, sorry, you've turned your microphone off. Turn your speaker uh, off. So if you go to the bottom right of your screen, you should have um, an option to, to turn your speaker off. I'll go for that one there. That's already clearer. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Natalie. Yeah. I'll try speaking, Rick. Yeah, is that any better? That's much yeah. better. Yeah, much okay. better. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. So, so look, here are the data for for phosphorus uh, in our village, uh, and you can see they run from ten pretty low, and as they come into the village, they increase. So we're seeing that increase from ten to twenty nine. That's essentially, I think, related to agricultural inputs. But as we come into the village, into the built-up area of the village, we jump into the 50s and the 60s. Uh, and this is actually, I think, pretty much coming from surface, uh, from urban surfaces. Um, and uh, in the middle there, you can see that figure of 570. That's the concentration of phosphorus coming. You see that at the top left, uh, that's the, uh, the pipe coming in from one of our housing estates. Uh, after the after a rain event, 
And so the surface runoff concentrations are very high as well. So we mustn't forget surface runoff as an important component in terms of phosphorus loading onto the system. But this is probably one of the most dirty polluted lakes in the whole of the world. Yet the water body that sits in has got high quality uh, uh, to the environment see water body data. So we do need to get back to the to finer scale. Uh, and again, that's something that I think we can do by um, bringing uh, local people and citizen scientists. Next one, next one please. Um, so this is just mainly final thoughts through about the importance of working with the citizens and the strengths and weaknesses. Um, harnessing interest, enthusiasm, skills, um, get, identifying important questions to the site, uh, synoptic sampling, uh, resolving things at the local scale, making helping them measure some determinants that can be measured accurately, um, and some biology can can be done uh, using local. <coughs> Uh, and knowledge exchange, and of course, getting the message out to the wider public. So these are the things that I've experienced uh, in our high wharf work. The next click, uh, and then the needs, as far as I'm concerned, really full engagement, professional direction and leadership, both in terms of designing projects, refining questions, uh, things like using chemistry, microbiology has to be done by experts accredited labs. Some of the biology needs to be done by professionals. There's important quality control and data management. And I think this last point for me is really important. In fact, what I find difficult, probably with my inability to do this, but is clearly explaining what's going on. And the general public just equate untreated effluent into the rivers and 14% and, and good ecological status. And it's so much more to us than that. And how much explanation is needed, uh, or does it matter that it's difficult to explain these things to, to the lay public? But these are some of the things that are important. Understanding people's pathogen, public health links, understanding eutrophication, local populations and nutrients, and the organic pollution, not demand, not the story being able to interpret data and explain what's natural and what's human activity. <clears throat> uh, and then critically, um, being able to uh, support campaign groups, uh, but making sure that they have uh, reliable science in their campaigning. So that's, for me, it, it works, but you do need this kind of uh, mix, mixture of abilities and skills and experience, knowledge. Next one, last one, please. Last one, please. Yeah, so just a final thought, in fact, clearly. Uh, it's, um, it's kind of community science, um, needing to engage with local people, need to raise funding locally. Um, it's, uh, uh, and, 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 and train local people. It's really a lot of fun, very hard work. And in, in my warfare, we have, 13 partners that we had to engage with, and it took us a long time and lots of grant applications to raise relatively small amounts of money. Um, the whole thing was about £15,000. And of course, managing looking after a team of people, or absolutely really good experience. But in retrospect, now I think we really need to be able to be working with either you know, environment agency, river, or research groups who have funding. Place, rather than having to deal with completely bottom up uh, with the local community. <clears throat> That's slide. Yeah, so just thanks to, to uh, these wonderful people, in fact, really, from lots of different organizations, but especially to uh, Roger Dale Griffiths Trust, uh, uh, who, in fact, uh, you know, have been able to coordinate all the work that we've been doing. Thanks. Sorry about all that. So, no, great. thank you, Rick. Um, A crazy session. <clears throat>
Um, so hopefully everybody managed to catch those last few slides. I think we did have a few issues with the sound there at the end a little bit, but um, I'm hoping that um, most people managed to catch uh, what you were trying to say. Oh, we've got two of you. That's why we had an echo. Um, apologies. I couldn't actually see the screen whilst I was sharing the slides. Um, so I'm going to hand over very quickly uh, to uh, Paul. Um, Hopefully you've got some questions for Rick. If you do, put them in the chat uh, and we'll just select a few uh, to go through now quickly. Yeah, thanks, Gwen. Um, yeah, I don't think we've got that much time, but first um, somebody asked a question, Rick, um, saying it's interesting that treated sewage exceeds safe public health levels and sort of what is the public health role responsibility for consented discharges, but also sort of that question that you re referred to earlier, you know, what are the ecological implications for for the for these levels of, of sewage? So sort of two questions there really in one, one about the public health responsibility for consented discharges and the other about ecological impacts. Yeah, the public health, the, people don't seem to be too, too concerned about it. In fact, it, it's only essentially linked to the designated uh, uh, bathing waters. Uh, so, so I think all our rivers have got higher concentrations of fecal bacteria most of the time than is uh, 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 that would that certainly would uh, probably bathing anywhere would actually c cause a public health issue. Um, uh, and it's essentially just the bathing water sites in fact that, that are actually scrutinized. Um, uh, so yeah, um, it, it's a, I don't know really. Quite, I mean, at one stage I thought there might be a public health issue, uh, but it's only I think unless there's really some uh, more serious illnesses occurring that probably a public health England might 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 get involved. Um, what was the second question? Sorry, that was. Um, yeah, and the second one was related to, and you sort of said something about it earlier. But somebody asked about what are the ecological implications of sort of increased fecal bacteria. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't think that I, I, my evidence is that there, there perhaps aren't any. We, we've got all these high concentrations, mm. in fact, but it, it looks as if the the biology is responding essentially to, to the nutrients. Um, yeah. uh, and it's the nutrients from the treated effluent. So if, if you were to actually look at what the most important things to do to improve the ecology of a river like the Wharf, you would actually go to, you know, phosphorus removal. Uh, from the from the from the treated effluents as the first thing to do. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, OK. And um, a question. Um, uh, with your volunteers, uh, it was interesting that that last slide or last but one slide you had where you said you got professional help for some things and then you got volunteers involved with other things. And I was wondering to what extent I suppose, especially with your background as well, what to what extent are were volunteers involved in the interpretation and the data processing? Um, so the of the of the data, not just the sampling. Did you was was that yeah, part I mean, of what they did as well? Uh, what I think the best thing about the volunteers is is in fact they're asking questions. So so essentially, you would actually uh, uh, their, their main function, I think, really is in fact is is this. Uh, intelligent sampling, um, and, uh, as, as I mentioned. Uh, when it comes to data interpretation, you do need, I, I think, professional expertise. But when you then produce a report, the, the, it's interesting what, I can't give you an example, I don't think, but it's interesting that people then will respond and ask questions. And quite often some of those questions, in fact, really, uh, are, are interesting and important. And, and, and make you sort of think in ways that you didn't think about how to interpret the data. Uh, a lot of it comes down uh, rather than data interpretation to then this uh, problem that I, I think we all have as scientists, in fact, is being able to actually explain things mm. uh, and, mm. and, and at what level of detail you need to go into. And I guess you get to a certain level of detail and you lose people lose interest and glaze over. In, in <laughs> so, um, yeah. yeah okay thanks for that well we didn't glaze over that was really really interesting uh, thanks very much and Gwen I think do we need to hand back to you now uh yeah I think we've got time for one more question if you can answer it succinctly Rick 
Um, and uh, then we will uh, hand over to Bill just for some information on our next webinar, which is kind of linked to this, which will be next week and close the call. I don't think we had another question on the list, actually. We dealt with okay. there were two. There were two on public health. I mean, there was one related to the public health, which was sort of was, was a slight we're taking it a bit further, which was saying, well, isn't any isn't any any bacteria, even lower concentrations of bacteria present a risk to public health? So somebody said, well, doesn't it mean yes. that, you know, that there will always be a risk if there's bacteria present? Yes. Actually, it's worth just saying something a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, there's always a risk. Uh, there's a difference between benign bacteria and most like path pathogens. And so the interesting issue is pathogens. And one of the things we're trying to do now is to actually identify what, in fact, the risks are, what, are, what the specific pathogens are. And one thing I didn't point out is that E. coli and, and IE, I mean, these are indicators uh, of uh, fecal pollution, they're not in themselves necessarily the most important risk. Uh, so we've been doing some DNA work on the assemblage of fecal bacteria uh, in the wharf. And it turns out, in fact, that the concentration of E. coli uh, is actually hardly measurable. Uh, the, the bacterial flora, if you feel like, really is dominated by, by many other species. A uh, lot of which I've got I've no 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 concern in fact, but quite a few do. And so there are things like Mycobacterium aeromonas, all the things which actually cause specific particular illnesses that we need to be able to identify. And so at the moment we've got a project where we're taking samples um, from the bathing water site and comparing the E. coli concentrations, hopefully we will be able to compare the E. coli concentrations with the content concentrations of all the other pathogenic bacteria in there and ask a question, answer the question, is E. coli a good indicator of all the other pathogens in there? And then what are the other pathogens in there, in fact, that might actually cause uh, serious illnesses? And there are one or two kind of, uh, you know, concerns, in fact, but that's, I that, that's on the research side at the moment. OK, brilliant. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, thanks from, every, from, from everybody here. And uh, yeah, it was, it was really interesting stuff, Rick. Much appreciated. I'm going to hand over to Bill, who's going to tell people about the next <coughs> webinar in the series. Thanks, Rick. That was great talk. Um, just wanted to say we've got a, another seminar, which is another webinar next week on the 29th between 10 and 11. Um, and this is this is um, work from Dave Barber and Martin Fenn from the EA who've been working on eutrophication issues. Dave actually, Dave Barber was is works in the Dales and has worked with Rick on the wharf project, but he's looking also in the upper reaches of the wharf and how how we can use a, a sort of weight of evidence approach, but also trying to include citizen science methods within that. Um, and Martin's from Midlands, but has done work on the River Y, which, as you all know, has had um, lots of in interest and issues over the last few years. Um, but Martin also works on the River Team demo with, with that group there. So they're going to be doing a joint act um, looking at how the EA use citizen science data and, and look at how they can combine that with data of their own to try and resolve a lot of these issues. So that's next week, um, as I say, 10 to 11. OK. Um, Thanks, Bill. Gwen, I'm aware that more questions have come in afterwards. I, I mean, know. Can, can we forward those on to, to Rick or? Yeah, we could forward some of those on to Rick. I'm hoping that, um, yeah, Cathy, I think you touched on DNA a little bit there, Rick, when you were answering that last question. But yeah, if anybody has any questions for Rick, please do email them across to us um, and we can forward those on to you, if that's OK, Rick. Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> brilliant. And thank you very much to you for a um, really interesting presentation. Um, sorry about the... Well, um, no, the glitches little... were all our, on our side. <laughs> <laughs> It's fine. It wouldn't be a, a webinar without some glitches. Yeah, so, um, yeah, no, so yeah, thanks for your help. To form. Um, and yeah. thank you, everyone, and hopefully see you all next week then. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Rick, for my DRT. Hey, welcome.
I'm not sure what that was. I can't remember. <coughs>